Thank you guys so much. And before I introduce Yen, I do want to just mention that on April 2nd, 2nd it's World, Acceptance, World Autism Acceptance Day. And once again, we're going to launch our Go Yellow campaign, which has been a, um, it's built over the last few years to get a lot of momentum. Um, hopefully this year, we haven't 100% confirmed, but we have some iconic buildings in Melbourne go yellow, and a lot of our Facebook community changed their profile to yellow. Um, it's just a good way to shine a po positive light, and we might feature stories of our tribe. So if you've got anything that you want to send to us to share about your journey or your story, please email us at info at yellowladybugs.com.au, and we'll share it on the day. So it's all about going yellow, um, for the day. Okay, so Yen. Yen has been with the Yellow Ladybugs from the very beginning. I pretty much think maybe it was my first or second call. I don't know, Penny and Yen, um, to reach out to people to try and get um, them as a ambassador for this idea I had for Yellow Ladybugs. And boy, were we lucky to find Yen. Um, Yen has such a a long list of accomplishments in this space um, as a presenter, an autism advocate, a community leader, a Yellow Ladybugs ambassador, and a author? Yes, yes multiple author. Um, it would take me a long time to list all her accomplishments, um, their accomplishments, but suffice to say that Yen has a huge following and has published six books, I believe. Is that correct? In Hopefully seven. Okay, fingers crossed seven, lucky seven, um, including the guide to good mental health for people on the autism spectrum. And Yen has a number of awards and will bring um, their life experience in an unmissable talk today. I first heard Yen talk and I was wowed by the story, so I'm so proud to bring um, Yen here today. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming... Yen. Uh, I think the light's okay. Hello, everyone. I'm just going to pop my... I'm going to take the lid off my water so I don't have to... Oh, that's better with the lights. Thank you, people. Just put that there so I don't have to halfway through grab the water. So... We've got my lovely slide. Really privileged to be here today. People that know me on social media know that when I give a talk, I say that I want to rock the Casbah. Well, the speakers this morning have rocked the Casbah so much that I don't know that I can rock it much more. <laughs> really great speakers. So thank you to all of them for today. And I'm just going to work through my slides. And so some of my slides are about my own lived experience, my own personal journey. And some of them are more, maybe a little bit political even, talking about how we can change things that aren't working very well. So I'm starting, as I mean to continue, with a meme. I do a different meme every day on social media. And this one says, I talk openly about my mental illness because I don't believe it is a reason to be ashamed. If anyone... If anyone... If everyone felt able to talk about their mental health, I think stigma would be a lot less of a problem. And that's a lot smaller for me to read than it is for you. I might just let you read those. So about me, um, and my slides appear to have done some interesting things here. Uh, that's okay. I can just talk about me. Um, I am an autistic uh, author. I'm also someone with a diagnosis of atypical schizophrenia and a mood disorder, which I've had for a very long time. I'm an advocate. I'm a public speaker. I have a very wide experience of psychiatry and psychology, and sadly not all of it has been very positive. And I'm someone who's really passionate about making a difference in this space. And yes, that is a picture of me with my feline friend, Mr Kitty. So here's me doing some of the stuff I do. Um, the one on the left there is me doing a radio show in Canberra where I live on a radio station called 2CC and for about a year I had a regular show called Talking Disability that I co-hosted and in that one I'm talking to Matt Ormiston from the ANZ Bank about their Spectrum program. Up the top are some of my books, yay to that, and down the bottom there is my mum, who's lovely, also autistic, me, and then a big picture of my head, because I'm on a mural. <laughs> I'm on a mural in Canberra for local heroes, which I think is funny on many levels, um, but good. So my own mental health journey. 
I was diagnosed as what was then known as Asperger's in 1994, which is about as early as any adult I know was diagnosed with Asperger's. A year later, I was diagnosed with schizophrenia. And of course, I didn't accept either of those things for several years to come for a number of reasons. The diagnoses were more helpful than not helpful. They enabled me to get you know, support and things like that. But when I was a bit older, I got really unwell and ended up in the psych ward. And there's a lot of talk about the psych ward in this presentation. Um, and I got misdiagnosed with borderline personality disorder by a um, clinician who really didn't understand autism well at all and certainly didn't understand what it was in me. And so I was seen as being borderline. That was a totally different diagnosis. It led to me being considered manipulative and um, rude and um, demanding and a not very nice person. It's like a character flaw according to the, the, the people I was uh, staying with. And the impact on that was that I ended up being institutionalised in all sorts of nasty places, including prison on several occasions, for around sort of the next three and a half, four years. Thankfully, I finally used that misdiagnosis for something positive. And so when I was 25, I was referred to a service called Spectrum, not the autism spectrum, but a service that dealt with people and supported people with borderline personality disorder, which I learned as soon as I got there was a misdiagnosis because I was nothing like the other people there and they were all like each other. So I figured it was the wrong label, but that was okay um, because I made use of it. And so from that, I built my confidence. Um, I learned it was a dialect behaviour therapy model that they used and I found that was greatly effective in helping me manage my mental health nasties. And so I enrolled in university, I built my confidence around employment and within a few years I ended up amazingly, given my history, um, as a Commonwealth public servant. So I moved to Canberra. Now I thought, I still had schizophrenia, I, I still took medication for it, but I thought that public servants were all middle class and respectable and they didn't need psychiatry. Um, actually, that wasn't true. And in 2010, I got more and more unwell for a number of reasons. And because it was psychosis and psychosis will play tricks on you, I didn't realise what was going on. But I knew at some point I needed to access help. And so I became a very unwell professional employee and all that entailed. And through that period of illness that lasted for about two or three years... And I somehow managed to keep my job and keep my home, which amazes me because I was extremely unwell. I had eight hospital admissions in a two-year period. I took nine months of leave from work. Thankfully, I had income protection insurance through my super, so I didn't starve. But it was a hard fought and one thing, my sanity and my sort of social position and my, my job and all of those things. But through that period of illness, somehow, and I wish I could distill the knowledge and give it to everyone because it's wonderful, but somehow I learned insight and self-awareness and so I've got a lot of that now, which means I can manage major mental health issues and do quite well at everything I'm doing despite that. So I'm going to use myself as a case study. It's very easy to use yourself as a case study. You don't do any interviews or anything like that. It's great. Um, <laughs> My lovely meme here says, never ever give up, you don't know what's around the corner. And I firmly believe that, that's really important to know. So my case study is about the issues I, accessed, I had in accessing mental health care when I was unwell in 2010. So the crisis services were largely unhelpful. They'd say to me, did you go to work today? And I'd say, yes. And they said, oh, well, you must be fine, go home. The problem was the only part of my work that was functioning, uh, my life that was functioning was my employment. That was the only, I was dragging myself into the office. That was it. I wasn't eating. I wasn't sleeping. I didn't wash. I didn't use the shower. All of those things cause for a number of delusional reasons that were going on. But all the crisis services knew was if someone's going to work, they must be okay. And I was asking all the wrong questions, but so were they. And that was really difficult. And I had it in my mind. I don't think this now. But I thought that if you wanted um, support from mental health services, they had to initiate it. They had to ask the questions. Whereas now I know if I'm ever in that situation again, I would say I'm really unwell. The fact that I'm going to work is unimportant. I'm actually extremely unwell. I need assistance now. That's what I'd say now. But I didn't know that at the time. Another issue which people have talked about a bit is alexithymia, which is that idea of being unable to articulate your emotions well and understand what they mean. It doesn't mean we don't have emotions. We certainly do. But it's a matter of not being able to articulate that, which made it really 
really difficult because the staff from the crisis service would say, how do you feel? And I'd say, good. I didn't feel good, but I didn't know what I felt and I've been taught that what you say if someone asks how are you is good. Um, the illness impacted on my perception of life and so I believed that I was being punished by God. I believed that my medication was, um, was actually toxic and I needed to stop taking it. All these really dangerous, scary things. But when I finally did get support, I realised that I was not alone and that there were other autistic people going through all these challenges and difficulties who could benefit from some knowledge and support. So I've spent a lot of my time taking the opportunity to teach services about autism and mental illness. Uh, my strategies, I'm a fan of strategies. I've managed to, I have a major mental illness that makes my life very difficult a lot of the time. Um, and yet I manage it because I use strategies. And I don't think we can fix a lot of things, but we can put things in place to help it work better. And that's my approach. So some of my lovely strategies are distraction. And distraction is basically focusing on something other than what your brain's doing and focusing on, on something enjoyable or engaging. And when you do that, you're not focusing on feeling miserable. So that's that's a really nifty skill. Assertiveness, it's not necessarily a mental health skill in and of itself, it's more a life skill, but it's a really useful one and it's a hard one to get. I reckon I was 42 before, and I'm 44 now, before I actually understood how to use assertiveness properly. But it's great because you can set boundaries with people and you don't have the people encroaching on your space and things like that. You can actually say, no, I'm sorry, I can't do this right now. And it's a great thing. It's a great liberation. The photo there is of my favourite strategy, which is Mr <laughs> Kitty, of course, my black cat strategy. Um, for a lot of autistic people, animals, um, Shadi was talking about equine and horses and things like that. I think for so many of us, animals are really important. Perspective. Perspective is a wonderful strategy for mental health and for mental health and well-being. If you understand where things are coming from and it's not actually the end of the world, it makes it easier to deal with. For me, regular psychiatrist appointments are something I will be doing for the rest of my life, I think, unless a miraculous cure for psychosis turns up, which would be awesome. Don't want a cure for autism ever, but I, I'd be quite happy to get rid of the mental illness if I could. But until that happens, regular psychiatric appointments are really important. Creativity, which for me is writing and art. And for lots of autistic people, that creative sense is really high. When I'm creating, firstly, it's a lovely distraction and I'm engaged in that creativity. But secondly, it actually produces things. I actually say, oh, I wrote a book, look at that. Not only did I distract myself, I've got this useful piece of literature that people can use, so it's great. Medication, medication is a bit fraught. Not everyone likes medication, some people won't take it. I don't like when people tell me not to take medication because for me, I need to take my medication. If you have a psychotic illness, generally, and it's been going on for more than 20 years, as mine has, generally taking medication is probably a good idea. And when people say you shouldn't take that, it's poison or whatever, well, if I'm a bit unwell, that's the last thing I need to hear. So I've actually blocked people on social media over telling me to stop taking my meds because it's not helpful and it's actually potentially dangerous. Um, that being said, medication is an individual choice and it's an individual decision. So I would also not say to people, you should take medication. Um, I think it is something that you need to work out for yourself or with your close supports. And talking of supports, social support in your peer group is a really important protective factor for my mental health. I know people think social media is a bit vacuous and silly, but my social media is a very genuine place. And whenever I'm online, I am among friends. And that's a wonderful thing. And to all my Facebook book friends out in the audience, thank you very much because it really makes my life a lot easier and it makes it easier for me to do what I do. So I've got a lovely meme here. I think I can read this one. It's, it's a little screen. Um, mental illness is not a character flaw, weakness or lack of willpower. You might as well tell someone with heart disease to make their heart beat more regularly as tell someone with depression to snap out of it. And that is so true. The unhelpful information people love to lavish on people with mental illness and their families is, is ridiculous. So I've talked about me. I'll stop talking about me now and I'll talk about autism and mental health conditions a bit more generally. 
So autistic people experience all the mental illnesses that anyone else does. We have a very high rate of anxiety disorders, very high rates of depression, but also eating disorders, post-traumatic stress, which um, sadly, those, those things are based in environment. I think a number of the speakers this morning talked about um, depression and anxiety for autistic people aren't just a chemical brain thing. They're actually based in experience of bullying and abuse and all these dreadful things that, that autistic people are subjected to. Um, and post-traumatic stress is a very clear example of that. That's a very environment-based mental health problem. And then there's low prevalence conditions like schizophrenia and bipolar, which we also have. Um, and some psychiatrists have had all these mythological views that you can't have schizophrenia and Asperger's, which has made my life difficult on occasion, but you actually can. <laughs> Um, so some of the issues that autistic people with me mental illnesses face, a lack of understanding of autism amongst clinicians, I'm going to be coming back to that dot point a few times because it's a major issue, trauma, and when we talk about trauma I think a lot of people assume it's past trauma, but it isn't necessarily, a lot of people go and undergo trauma on an ongoing basis and it's something that continues throughout life sadly. Alexithymia, that idea of being asked how do you feel, very unhelpful. Difficulties developing self-awareness and isolation and loneliness. And even in this day and age when we've got social media, when we've got online groups, we've got support for autistic people, there are still a lot of us who feel isolated and alone. And that's, um, that's a real issue. And it's a huge risk, risk factor around uh, mental, mental illness as well. Some other issues can include mental illness impacting through transition points because often the onset of a mental illness is in adolescence or childhood and so the people are coming up for finishing school and they got really unwell or starting further education or starting employment. It can actually make something that's really difficult for autistic people anyway even more difficult. Difficult is seeking and accessing help. Um, sometimes the help isn't particularly helpful and sometimes it's just really hard to realise that you need to access help. Communication difficulties. So autism is not a deficit. I would never say it is because it isn't. But it's a difference and communication is a key area of difference between neurotypical and non-autistic people. And so the problem with that is that most neurotypical people don't realise that there are other ways to communicate. And so they assume that if someone doesn't communicate the way they do, that they're doing something wrong. If you translate that into a mental health perspective, when you're accessing help from psychiatrists, psychologists, it can really skew the picture of what's going on and be very difficult. Unhelpful help, we can get this from relatives and friends and people thinking they're doing us a big favour by telling us to put Manuka honey on our infection. Um, <laughs> seriously. Um, however, we can get unhelpful help from people who are supposed to know better, like psychiatrists, psychologists, occupational therapists, people like that. So lots of people can have unhelpful thinking. I remember when I was in hospital in 2010, the first admission in that period of admissions when I lived in Canberra, and this young psychiatrist said to me, you're not autistic, Jeanette, you're way too cool to be autistic. And I remember thinking, but I write books about it, what's going to happen? <laughs> So, so that was a classic piece of unhelpful help. And of course, the usual issues that others with mental illnesses have, so stigma and its impacts and just the issues caused by the mental illness because, you know, there's a reason that their diagnosis... These, these slides didn't want to do this, did they? Um, this one's about autistic burnout, so I'll do my best to remember what I said. I should have tested the slides, but that's OK, it's all good. That is me looking extremely unhappy. I'm not sure I was in burnout, but I was certainly close to meltdown on a bus a few weeks ago. Um, so burnout is basically when there's an overload of sensory or social or all sorts of other kinds of input over a period of time that gets you to sort of breaking point and you get to a point where you can not go on any longer and it's a really difficult thing and it's not well understood. Now hopefully the next slide I can read. There we go. I'll talk a bit about my own experience of burnout. So how does it manifest with me? Well I'll give an example. I'm somebody who needs to be acutely aware of when I'm getting burnt out because I manage a huge workload. Um, I don't want to let people down. I've got a bunch of talks booked for this year. I don't want to let anyone down by not doing them, that kind of thing. So I'm always aware of this stuff. But sometimes it gets away with me. So a few years ago I had someone online who was messaging me all the time and they were very angry and they were working through a lot of anger and they were demanding and it was a very difficult relationship. It was a friend and I didn't 
know what to do about it. So I, I didn't want to block them because I, I felt it was a bit mean to the guy. So um, I didn't. So I kept having all this input every day. And every time my phone would go ding, I'd know it was a message and I'd go into fight or flight mode. And then I went up to a conference in Brisbane short at the same time and had a really bad experience there. Something really nasty happened. And I got home and I was just in heightened stress for months. And it was that level of physical physical awareness of cortisol in the brain for a long period of time. And I had to really carefully come out of that by doing less things, by limiting social stuff. And I did block the person. And thankfully, I've unblocked them. They've, they've, um, they're doing quite well now. So I'm quite happy that I unblocked them. But at the time, it was a necessary to do, thing to do for self perfection protection. So what do you do about burnout? How do, you, how do you address it? Well, if possible, avoid it. And the best way to do that is understanding your triggers and understanding what's going on when you're leading up to burnout, um, which can be as easier said than done. Um, but knowing when to stop is one thing that I do. If I, if I get home and there's so much on, and I just think, no, I can't do it. It's too much. The tank's full. I'm going to watch Brian Cox. Brian Cox is the solution to everything in my life. <laughs> and, um, and so that's really useful. And practising assertiveness, because for me, it's very much based in social overload. It's very much based in people demanding my time and all of those things and wanting to talk to me when I maybe haven't got the, the, the social spoons in order to do so, that kind of thing. So assertiveness is really useful. Not taking on anything else and recognising when it's approaching, if possible, and then putting in place strategies, because that is much easier to manage than when you've gone into full-blown burnout and you don't quite know what to do. Um, oh, I'm not even going to try and read that. So, issues in accessing mental health services. Um, the, one of the main ones is, is clinicians um, not understanding and making assumptions and things like that. Um, oh, can I actually read that? Thank you. I can actually see that on that screen, but not this one. So misdiagnosis is a huge problem for autistic people, often because clinicians don't understand or have much knowledge about autism. So autism might look like something else, and autism mixed with a mental illness might look like something completely different to what it is. And clinicians often have a real difficulty understanding where things are coming from with an autistic person, and so that will be interpreted in a negative way. Uh, it's cool, Penny, I can read it. So yes, not being listened to and not being understood comes down to, um, comes down to communication issues and communication differences. So what, what people are hearing is different to what we're saying and that's really difficult when you're trying to access support. And also when you're unwell, you're going to be more impacted in your abilities to do these things anyway than you would normally. Um, intersectional disadvantage, do we all know about intersectionality? Yep, so the idea that different kinds of disadvantage compound other kinds of disadvantage. So if you imagine for me, I'm autistic, I have a mental illness, I'm an ex-prisoner, um, I'm gender diverse, I'm sure I've got some other ones. And so each of those doesn't add to the other, it compounds, it multiplies the other. And this is a real issue in mental health services because it means people can be really disenfranchised and disempowered, which is dreadful. And I'm always for empowering people accessing health supports, definitely. And discrimination in services. I remember being in hospital once and this woman assaulted me for reasons best known to herself and I was pretty upset. I went and talked to the nurses and the nurse said, oh, you shouldn't be so annoying. And, you know, <laughs> yes. Apparently, apparently I'm responsible for physical violence committed against me. So issues in clinical services a poor understanding or assumptions around autism, which you talked about. Entrenched ableism, I think that comment that I mentioned before represents some entrenched ableism. A poor understanding of the impact of sensory issues. I'm going to go back to the psych ward for this one. You imagine you're in the locked ward and they've got fluorescent lights and you can hear fluorescent lights buzzing. You're actually that aware of them and they are overwhelming. And so the whole time you're there, not only are you unwell enough to be in hospital, but the lights are absolutely getting into your brain. And if no one understands that, what's that going to lead to? Could lead to aggression, could lead to self-harm, could lead to someone hiding under the bedclothes all day. And I've tried doing that for sensory stuff and a nurse came in and said, you shouldn't be in bed at this time of day. And it's like, yeah, great. Um, so 
Yes, so the impact of sensory issues is really necessary to know, particularly in clinical services. Poor understanding of overload, once again, people having a meltdown can be seen as being aggressive um, or being self-destructive when actually they just need some time to their space to get, get through it and, and be supported to, to avoid that in the future. Hyper-empathy, I think a couple of the speakers talked about this, intuitive empathy. So when I'm standing next to an angry person, I can't tell from looking at their face that they're angry, but I can feel their anger because I'm standing next to them and I'm absorbing the anger. Can you imagine when you're in the psych ward and everyone's angry or sad or confused or stressed or a combination and you pick up not only on your own misery but on all of that? I will now say to my doctor if I'm really unwell, I would rather be at home feeling miserable with Mr Kitty than be picking up on everyone else's misery, thank you very much. And he's really good, he respects that, which is great, but it's really difficult and the potential for random aggression or not so random aggression. So if you imagine someone's had a whole load of stress going on, there's sensory issues in where they are, um, they, they've been asking nurses repeatedly to, be, um, to have something done, say something fixed in their room and it hasn't been done, um, they've been wanting to do something and no one's been available and someone walks across them and they suddenly shove them out of the way because... It's not because, and it looks dreadful, it looks like they're really sociopaths just attacking someone for no reason. They might be attacking that person for no reason that person's done, but there's a lot of reasons going on. And understanding aggression in services is really important. I have one of my people online, one of the people that follow me online, um, is in the UK, and she has a child who's been in the locked ward for four years, and most of it has been about meltdowns. Just a lack of understanding. I've written letters, don't worry, but um, that kind of thing is dreadful. And then we've got some memes. I'm going to just let you guys read these. Let's stand here and go, read the memes. <laughs> I'll have some water while we do that. There we go. Are we all done or are you still going? You're done, excellent. Um, so what needs to happen with all this stuff? Because I've just posed a bunch of problems. I don't like to pose a bunch of problems without suggesting a few solutions. So one of the main important things is for clinicians to have or build their understanding of autism. The idea, I think it was Michelle said that they get, what, an hour? No, Tony said a lot of the clinicians get an hour. That's absolutely not... I think everyone in this room will say that's not acceptable. So... Compulsory autism and disability training for mental health clinicians in their, in their qualifications and then regular accreditation for clinicians involves autism component, which includes autism and gender. And I don't just mean the female gender, I mean gender diversity because a huge percentage of autistic people are trans and gender diverse. This is a reality in our community. I am. Um, I know a number of other people who are. There is research evidence on this coming out now, suggesting that even as much as 20% of autistic people are trans and gender diverse. And so when we're talking about autism and mental health, we're also talking about gender diversity, and that's really important. Um, peer mentoring in clinical settings, that can be really useful. Um, it's great to know your tribe, and it's great to know your tribe when you're in a mental health setting and you feel a bit lost and, and, and overwhelmed, and to have another autistic person in there is a good thing. And autistic people being consulted in the design and implementation of services, including buildings. Get rid of the down lights, get rid of the fluorescent lights. <laughs> um, what else needs to happen? I've got, I love this dot point, respect. What do I mean by no more glass screens? Well, I now have a private psychiatrist who I've been seeing for some years and it goes really well. But I used to access the local area mental health service that was government funded. And I go into the building and to give your Medicare card to the receptionist, there was a screen that went up to the ceiling, even bigger than in the bank. And there's a little window and you'd shove your card in and they'd do what they did and shove it back. It was totally demeaning. And then when you wanted to talk to the psychiatrist, you wait in the waiting room and the psychiatrist would pop their head around the door and say, room two, thank you. And so you go around to room two, which the psychiatrist would then unlock from the inside. What was in this room that it needed to be locked under lock and key? There's a whiteboard, a bin, two chairs, a table, and I believe there may have been a box of tissues. That was it. And the whole power dynamic going on in this place 
was horrific. I, and some people might say, oh, but sometimes people with mental illness are violent. Well, you know what? Quite often people at the pub are violent, but could you imagine going in there with a screen like that? <laughs> could you? I think there would be comments on the nanny state, and rightfully so. Um, so the respect one is a really important thing. Mental health diagnoses are based on observation and listening. This is, we don't have blood tests for mental health conditions at this point in time. So any mental health... Autism and ADHD are a bit different because they have standardised tests, but most of the mental illness conditions are diagnosed through a psychiatrist observing or a psychologist observing. Um, so if this is how it's done... It needs to be genuine observation and listening, not coloured by assumption and stereotypes, and it needs to be coming from a place of understanding of autism. Awareness and action on sensory issues in clinical services. I think anyone who has sensory processing issues who's in a psychiatric ward or, or an area mental health service or anything like that will thank us if we fix that. Um, stigma about mental illness and autism needs to be addressed, of course, and... Um, I don't know why the legislation squished up really tiny there, but relevant legislation needs to be enacted that reflects respect and inclusion, and that's really important because that's at the societal level. So how do we make it happen? Well, some of this stuff is beyond what individuals can do. So changes to the training of clinicians, attitudes of the system, attitudes of society, these are beyond my ability to fix or any of your ability to fix. But these are things that need advocacy and I would say activism in some cases as well. So this is work for all of us to do um, in making change. Supporting autistic people, be them ourselves, our kids, whoever that might be, to self-advocate is a really useful strategy for, um, for people. Um, building understanding and knowledge of mental health clinical services in the community. So at the moment, if you say, I went to the psych ward, there's a whole lot of mystique about that, isn't it? People don't really know what it means. It should just be... I'm, I'm unwell and I need to access support, so I'm going to hospital, which is where you go when you're sick. Like, that's all it needs to be. It does not need to be a big othering thing, and yet it is. So I think the more we can talk about clinical services with friends and colleagues, the better, really. Um, building on... Uh, knowing that we deserve better. So I have been subjected to all manner of abuse in mental health services over the years. It's been horrific. Um, However, it's only recently that I've known that I deserve better and everyone deserves to know that they deserve better. It's really important because we don't and this is why thing, one of the reasons things happen and no one complains is that we don't realise we should complain, but we should. When abuses, when violence and anything like that happens, when a misdiagnosis happens that puts you in institutions for the next three years, this is not right. This is not fair. So that's one thing. It's an attitude of knowing that we know better, uh, knowing that we deserve better, and supporting clinicians' understanding of autism. So my psychiatrist, who is lovely, um, I've been teaching him about autism for some years, and he's learning really well. <laughs> I love. This is one of my earliest memes, and I just love it to bits. And it says, "You are the CEO of your own life. It's you making the decisions." Of course, that speaks to something that we know in psychological terms as an internal locus of control, which is basically you can't change what's going on outside of you, but you can change how you respond. So I say with that model, I say you can't change the economy, even if you're the CEO, but you can decide what your strategies are to manage it. So I just thought, it'd, just to finish up with, that it'd be nice to do some practical strategies for autistic people that I know have worked really well for me and have worked really well for people I've known. I thought that'd be a nice way to finish up because it's quite a political presentation, this one, talking about all the issues with the system. But there are practical things that we can do to support our mental health. So learn what distractions are helpful for you and they're going to be different for every person. Look at what's happening to understand how you're feeling. So when I'm depressed, I don't clean my house and I can't clean my house. Now, I don't feel depressed. I have to be extremely depressed to feel depressed. But if I think, oh, there's a weird emotional thing, I'm not sure what it is and I can't clean my house, I can back it in, that's depression. Whereas if I've got an elevated mood, which sounds like a good thing but really isn't, and cost your reputation and your credit card... Um, <laughs> 
But when I have an elevated mood, I'll be sitting at home not wanting to go to bed at two in the morning working on the computer. And, ah, elevated, right, do something about that. So that's a really useful way if you've got alexithymia to understand what's going on in your emotional life just by knowing what kinds of things happen when you're feeling one way or another. Pets and assistance animals. I know three autistic people, including my mum, who don't like pets. Very rare. Almost everyone else I've ever met has really had a strong affinity with cats, dogs, horses, snakes, lizards, all sorts of things. Ferrets in one occasion. Um, animals are very important. And we often have, I know for me, I have a much deeper understanding of Mr Kitty. I have a very deep relationship with him. So it's not just a pet. He's actually a really important person in my life who happens to be a cat. Um, remembering that crises usually last for less than half an hour. That's a really intellectual one, but if you can actually get it inside yourself and believe it, it's a great thing. So about a couple of years ago, I was in major crisis at work. I'd had a message from someone online that was really hateful and I'd had to, I just had to leave. I just said to my boss, sorry, I have to go home. And I was in major crisis and meltdown. And I got on the bus and I listened to my music just to stay safe. And I thought, no, I have to go to hospital. And then I thought, no, you don't. This is a crisis. Go home and by the time you get home, you'll be fine. Not fine, but better. And I did. And it was a really hard thing to do. But I know now, if I'm in that crisis space and I can recognise I'm in that crisis space, I, I can just tell myself this is not going to last forever. And that's really important because the danger of a crisis is often that people feel like it'll last forever and ever and ever. Um, also, if possible, finding clinicians who understand and support and respect you. Now, there's a money issue there because if you're in the public system, it's extremely hard to ask to change your clinician. You get what you're given. So sadly, that's one of those things where me, as a slightly wealthy person, gets the privilege, which I'm not a fan of, um, because I can pay for a psychiatrist and if I don't like the one I've got, I'll find another. And that's a real issue because if you are in public services and you're having an issue with your, your doctor, there's very little you can do and that's definitely something that needs to change. But if you have got a clinician that you can work well with and that you have a good relationship with or who you can educate, that's a great thing. Some more strategies. Um, seeing yourself as being in a point in time, things will change. They might not get better necessarily, but they will be different. The idea of opposite action, that's a wonderful dialectical behaviour therapy skill. And it basically is exactly what it sounds like. It's really useful for depressed mood. So if you're depressed and you wake up and you think, I'm not getting out of bed, then the best thing you can do is get out of bed and have a shower or have breakfast, or both, because it tricks your brain into not feeling depressed. I've no idea how it works, but it is, it's, lots of people swear by that skill. It's really useful. Cultivating the view that you're the CEO of your own life, which I talked about before. A happy box, if that works for you. I tried a happy box. It wasn't for me. But um, <laughs> you, you, you put all the things that... It can be an online. It can be a virtual box as well as a physical box. But you put things that make you happy in there, and when you're feeling miserable, you go in and have a look. The other one which works for some people and not others is the gratitude journal. Now, that's a cognitive behaviour therapy skill, I think. And it basically involves writing down between one and three things you're grateful for that day. Now, it doesn't work when you're in the depths of despair. I had a similar thing set for me by a psychologist once when I was really in the depths of despair. I was in prison and I hated myself and I didn't want anything good to happen in my life ever again. And this well-meaning psych nurse said, here's five pages of paper, write your ultimate goal and then write five pages of how you get to it. And I'm thinking... Um, I don't have an ultimate goal to get to Saturday, maybe. And so I couldn't do this thing, and it was utterly demoralising. So the gratitude journal is like that. If you're in the depths of despair and nothing, you're not grateful for anything and you're not, you can't be able to do anything, um, then don't use that one. But if you're sort of moving through things and feeling a bit better, it can be quite motivating. I've used it to good effect. And then just um, knowing that it's a sign of strength to ask for help. It can be really difficult to ask for help, but it's a real strength. Um, passionate interests is a protective factor. Of course, passionate interests can be used as a distraction as well. Um, and an autistic person's passions are, you know, they're a good thing generally. They're a good thing to focus on. 
Um, social support, online or face-to-face. -face. Online is perfectly fine. I do a lot of my socialising online and it makes me happy. The idea of your tribe, your autistic peer group. When I was younger, we didn't have a tribe. I love that we do now. I actually was at a talk with Tony Atwood there um, in, when I found my tribe. I had the sense of it in 2009 up in Brisbane. You remember that one? There was a women and girls seminar and it was the first time I'd ever felt I belonged anywhere in my life and it's a really beautiful thing and it's you know it was 14 years after my diagnosis that I had that experience because I guess of the timings of things but that that tribe is really important that peer group and then there are support groups I've been running one in Canberra for how long since 2011 I know we've got at least one Canberra person here but um, yeah it's quite a long way to go otherwise just my support group <laughs> So there's some of my strategies. There's music, which um, I'm a big fan of. I think a few have talked about music. Um, that's me launching the mental health book. Not just bragging, but also public speaking is a protective factor for me. I love doing this stuff. And then, of course, Mr Kitty being beautiful. And I think this slide's a bit wonky as well. I don't know what it's done with these... Um, yeah, anyway, there are my details. I do have some business cards. I put some business cards out and everyone took them, but I've got some more if you missed out. So that's me done. Thank you very much, everyone. Well done, Yen. That was amazing again, and it's so good to hear your story um, and some really good insights, I think. You, it was a, bit, a little bit political, but we need to get there and this is recorded for online, so let's hope the government are listening. We are um, urging the government to take on the 101 recommendations that were made in the parliamentary inquiry. We keep on working at it. We're at a meeting this week only on that topic in Victoria. It needs to happen Australia-wide, but hopefully with uniting our community, we've got a stronger voice. So thank you so much for raising those points, Yen. Okay, so hopefully these slides are okay. Um, now to introduce you to a man who probably needs little introduction. This is definitely a full circle moment for me because it was on, def on my bucket list one day to have Dr Tony Atwood speak at, a at one of my events. So this is very um, personally very um, a, a great moment for me. Um, anyway, <laughs> enough about me. <laughs> Oh, thank you, thank you. Sorry, I'm going to leave it at that. No, no. It's a rather nice moment for me too. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Oh, that's nice. Thank you, Tony. It has been great to meet you. And um, I'm going to stop there because I'm embarrassed. So thank you, guys. <laughs> Dr Tony doesn't need an introduction. We all know about him and we're so excited to have him here today. Thank you. Wow, amazing. A very auspicious occasion today. It's a watershed moment. Quality of presentations have been amazing, but they're from the heart. And that's what made them so passionate and so powerful in so many ways. And I'm standing up and saying, I'm supposed to follow this? Oh, no. OK, well, here we go. Um, what? Oh, ah, it is there. Uh, right, that's me, and that's what we're doing. Right. Um, the, the world of emotions is hell for those with autism. That is aut um, emotions within you and in other people. We've had descriptions of the power of the emotions within you, but it's also in other people too. And the problem can be within the person is the strength of those emotions. This is a quote. If something happens to make me happy or upset, then I quickly become extremely happy or upset. I don't have many intermediate states, and I find it almost impossible to moderate my internal emotional response. Whereas new neurotypicals will have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Here's one, two, three, eight, nine, ten. <laughs> and it seems that anything that should have been four, five, six comes out as that intensity. And when I talk to people with autism about that, and it's very real, it's not a fake. When they are feeling despondent and suicidal, it's not a fake, it's not necessarily attention seeking, it is a very powerful and intense emotion. And throughout that person's day and life, they are experiencing very intense emotions, which is absolutely exhausting. 
But there's another dimension, and that is emotional sensitivity. There is a terrible error in understanding autism to say a lack of empathy, which is a huge insult to some of the kindest people I know as friends, colleagues, and family members. There is great caring. But I think there is a difference here that needs to be recognized. And this is being overly sensitive to another person's negative mood, infected by it. And it's almost as though somebody's in a negative mood, an equivalent level of a cold. But the person with autism gets infected by it, but they don't get a cold, they get the flu. And sometimes I'm, I'm really angry, sad, anxious. Where did this come from? What in my life has happened that will justify this emotional reaction? No, nothing's happened. You've just been with someone that is having that feeling. So it's not just simply the emotions within you, it's emotions within other people too. And especially sensitive to negative moods of disappointment, anxiety, or agitation. And that person picks it up and it really does disrupt their day. We call this empathic attunement. These are further quotes. There's a kind of instant subconscious reaction to the emotional states of other people that I've understood better in myself over the years, but it's been there since childhood. If someone approaches me for a conversation and they are full of worry, fear, or anger, I find myself suddenly in the same state of emotion. And this means that sometimes social withdrawal is not necessarily due to social confusion or sensory sensitivity. The withdrawal is a protection mechanism from being with toxic others with emotionality. And as we had from Yen a moment ago, I do all that I can to keep those with autism out of psychiatric hospitals, especially adolescent psychiatric hospitals, because it really is hell for that person in terms of the emotionality of other people. Quote, I'm able to distinguish very subtle cues that others would not see, or it might be a feeling I pick up from them. What neurotypicals do is they tend to use the visual and auditory. The visual is the facial expression and gesture. The auditory is the tone of voice. Now, in autism, you have a different sensory profile. And I think this is in a sixth sense sensitivity. And he's able to pick up emotions in other people using channels that neurotypicals aren't aware of that are accurate, definitely accurate, trust your intuition there, but can be overpowering. It's a sixth sense. So you avoid some social situations due to being sensitive to negative vibes. And this is my excuse. I'm a great fan of Brian Wilson of the Beach Boys. And he wrote the song Good Vibrations, and that's a picture of him at the time that he did. Happens to be at San Diego Zoo in uh, February 1966. Not that I remember anything exactly about that, but I can tell you all the details about it, and uh, he's one of my heroes since I was 14 and so on. Anyway, and that encyclopedic knowledge certainly can help you. Um, so, but you also have not only that sensitivity to mood in others, but... When somebody says, how are you feeling? Then the person with autism says, I don't know. What do you mean, you don't know? You can tell me about quantum physics. You can tell me about drain covers. You know every horse variation you can think of. How can you not know what you're feeling? No, I don't know. Well, what were you feeling when you had a meltdown? I don't know. I'm now going to complete the sentence. I don't know how to grasp one of the many thoughts or feelings swirling in my mind. Hold one, identify it, and explain it in speech so that you will understand it. The emotions are there. Oh, yes, in a rich vocabulary and variety of emotions. But converting thought and emotion to speech is a real problem. Now, when Michelle and I were doing our depression programs, and we were asking the group, um, can you tell us what's going on in your mind? What are your thoughts and feelings for depression? And we found that the major causes of depression were bullying and teasing from other people. And the seeds of low self-esteem were planted by the predators. Or depression due to 
exhaustion from the amount of mental energy to cope with your day. More on that in a moment. But we said to the guys, okay, we just, Michelle and I just decided, okay, we'll do this. And we had no idea how the reaction was going to be. We said, okay, between now and next week, could you create a playlist of music that in the songs or the lyrics, it perfectly describes your feelings? <laughs> Great. Go to Google Images. Type in sad. You'll have 500 images of sadness. Choose the five images that represent your feelings. You are a great fan of Harry Potter and Dementors, which are really depression <laughs> sucking out your happiness. Choose a scene in a Harry Potter novel that describes your sadness. You are a great fan of Star Wars movies. Choose a scene in a Star Wars movie that describes your feelings. And what I found with girls and women with autism, is that their career may be the arts, but the arts enable them to express the self and their inner world of emotions and experiences through art. They sometimes sing in perfect pitch, which is a bit of a problem, actually, because I saw uh, at the clinic the other day a woman of 24 who's remarkably good in uh, music, and her mother was sitting next to her, and her mother said, oh, yes, the two of us like to sing. And her daughter said, no, I hate singing with you. You're off key. <laughs> and I said, could you not join a local choral society? No, they can't sing. <laughs> and she's got perfect pitch and things like that. But it's also the artwork. I went to a, um, an exhibition recently, um, and I was looking at the paintings, and I said, to and the one painting just froze me because I thought, that's autism. Whoever painted that has autism. So I talked to the gallery owner and I said, who was the person who painted? And the, the, when she went, I thought, yes, you can just spot that autistic quality in the painting. It's, Michelle, you've not seen it, but I'll show you one day. It's absolutely brilliant. So it's an eloquence in poetry. It can be in typing. It can be anything else but look at me and tell me. And that's what psychologists and psychiatrists need to know. Converting thought and emotion to speech isn't the easy thing for that person to do. So it may well be that I think in the future we need to encourage in this area art and music, art therapy and music therapy as a way of exploring and expressing the self. But there's another way, and I was talking to an adult recently, and <clears throat> she was saying, I only know what I feel by seeing what I'm doing. There's that mind-body division. Now, what about happiness and enjoyment? Often through the special interest. It's the great joy of life. My emotional range is quite extreme and somewhat rudimentary. However, <laughs> when I engage in my special interest on my own, I can access a greater emotional realm and landscape that is wonderful and safe for me in that context. So for the person with autism, their greatest euphoric moment may be related to their special interest. may not be interpersonal, may not involve another person, but it is the excitement of discovering something new in your interest. It's different, it's not wrong. It's finding things in life that others don't see or understand and joy in life that others may not see or understand. But one of the problems can be with those intense emotions, especially negative emotions, is that thermometer can be a bit of a problem, especially in childhood, because you may have a degree of agitation from zero to 10, Neurotypical in, should we say, trying to solve a problem, their level of agitation and thinking may be, okay, I can't do it, I'll try another way, no, it doesn't work, I'll keep going, no, no, I'll be flexible, I'll be accommodating, I'll try another way, I'll get there eventually, level five out of ten, solved it, great, autism, I can't, got it, and I go to number ten, <laughs> and then the teacher says, come on, have another go, are you mad woman, that nearly killed me. So it means in your daily life, you have a minefield that you walk through of creating intense emotions, and they just explode. 
and destroy your happiness in many ways. Now, when we're working on emotions, then there are six standard emotions we will work on. Yes, there is a high level of depression. 75 to 85 percent of those with an autism spectrum disorder are prone to being sad. Sometimes a clinical depression can be anxious. Oh, yeah, one thing that those with autism are very good at, worrying. And sometimes anger. But actually, when we analyze why is the anger occurring, it's either depression that goes into not self-blame, but an externalized, agitated depression. You go into attack mode. But when you look at that person's life, they're very depressed. But rather than blaming themselves, it's a lack of respect and going externally. Or the anger is due to anxiety and being frustrated from access to strategies to alleviate your stress and anxiety, and that leads to anger. So although in autism there may be a high level of anger, when it comes to treatment, often the underlying emotion is depression or anxiety. But as clinicians, we have to work on the positive emotions in autism as well, happiness. And there can be in autism a difficulty resonating with the happiness of others. It's almost as though, in terms of intensity and types of emotions, if a person has negative emotions, um, really disliking that in other people because you pick it up, not know how to respond and so on, but also feeling uncomfortable with positive emotions and not knowing how to resonate with the euphoria of other people. And the tragedy is, in autism you can be infected by negative mood but not infected by being jollied up. And come on, yeah, look, come on, borrow my energy, yeah. No, it doesn't work. It's almost like a one-way system. The negative emotions, yeah, you get those, but not necessarily infected by the positive emotions. Neurotypicals need to realize that. Works for them, but not necessarily autism. Another difficulty in autism is, come on, just relax. Just, just, just relax. Just relax, relax, I don't know how to, just relax, come on, just give it a try, no idea, but also affection, and sometimes it's not a hug, it's a squeeze, and why are you squeezing me, and how does squeezing me solve the problem, and when the child is young, you learn don't cry, because if you cry, people squeeze you, So there can be a major issue. For neurotypicals, uh, affection is the fastest, most effective way of emotionally being restored. Here, no, you are invading my personal body space. When I talk to teenagers with autism, as I did this week with a group of teenagers who are concerned about their anxiety, and I said, when you're anxious, what do you want your parents to do? Leave me alone. Don't go near me. Don't ask what's the problem. I don't want to talk. Don't say anything. Don't hug me. Don't invade my personal body space. Now, the problem for neurotypicals is they try and do what works for them. And they need to know that Aspergerese or autism is a different culture. So you have a different way of emotional repair. Otherwise, neurotypicals are making it worse inadvertently in doing that. So there are problems with emotional arousal for both negative and positive emotions. Over the years, I've developed these programs, and this one, Exploring Feelings for Anxiety, with my name on it, but Michelle, your name should be on it too, because we did this together years ago. But my apologies for that, but it, it should, <laughs> it should, should have, have your name on it. Okay? Anyway, it's very good, and I recommend it. Um, <laughs> I also did one for anger, which should have Michelle's name on it too, because <laughs> we spent ages working on this and doing the programs. So that's one for anger as well. But at last, I learned my lesson. And this one has both our names on it. And this is to explain to those with autism why neurotypicals are obsessed with affection. And they are obsessed with it. And they need to be told they're loved and hugged every day. And I say, you have to feel sorry for neurotypicals. They're such fragile flowers. They have to be nurtured and loved and looked after every day. You are a cactus. 
with a prickly exterior because you have such a soft and vulnerable interior, you keep people away because they hurt emotionally. So you live successfully some distance from other cacti. The amount of affection water is one cup a month. And you're okay. But your mum or your partner is a rose in a rose garden that needs to be mulched and nurtured every day. You just have to feel sorry for them because they need that all the time. It's exhausting, but you've got to remember to give them two compliments a day. <laughs> right. So we have a program there on demystifying affection, but also explaining to parents and partners why the person with autism shows love and affection, but it might be in a different way. It's not less but it's just a different way of showing love. Now, sometimes with that difficulty of being in touch with your body, we have new technology which can be incredibly helpful. And that's sports technology. Fitbits, for example. In autism, there can be a mind-body division. And often the mind is not aware of the body. For example, in uh, Michelle and I, one of our teenage girl groups, we were talking about that sensory sensitivity and so on. Several of the girls out of eight said, when I'm ill, I don't know in advance when I'm going to vomit. I am going along and saying, where everyone else, oh, oh, I'll get to the toilet. You have all the antecedents to go. Here, it just happens. And you're not aware of the physiology of your body to be prepared for those components. Now that means that when you are agitated, whether you are anxious or angry, you are going to increase your heart rate. And if you're not aware of that, we need technology of sports devices, of increasing signs of agitation. For those parents who may be tuned into this, this also means when your daughter goes to school and she's a goody two-shoes and perfect, but when she gets home, she's dreadful. And parents will say, I wish she was like she is at school at home, because they like that person who's very calm and so on. What you may have is then a measure of heart rate throughout the day, and you have it on a graph. And that can give data, evidence to the teacher, that when you had a surprise test, she nearly lost it. Or when there was a replacement teacher in, when there was a transition even to a preferred activity, heart rate, boom, boom, boom. And what you find in autism is there are certain triggers, and it may be they can cope with three, but on the fourth, they lose it. If you only go one, two, three, I'm okay, I'm okay. But as soon as you hit the fourth, that's it, it's broken. But it also can teach you relaxation of sitting still, comfortably looking at the numbers and concentrating on your breathing and thinking to make the numbers fall. So, I don't have um, shares in Fitbits, but I find they're really good. <laughs> now, as an illustration of the mind-body division, this is of an adult male with autism, but I think this would go for females equally. Michelle and I were doing a diagnostic assessment of an adult in his 60s. Engineer, self-made man, uh, very successful career. And he was seen with his wife. And his wife said, I'm sure he has autism, Asperger's, but they didn't know about it when he was a child. But as I've discovered more about it, I think this is my husband. And lo and behold, yes, indeed. In his 60s, classic residual autism. So I decided in our conversation to talk to him about the life stages of someone with autism, primary school, high school, etc. And he said, Tony, you are describing events in my life I've never told anyone because I don't want to be thought of as mad or stupid or defective. I've hidden it. But you have given me a rationalization. It's like a 5,000-piece jigsaw puzzle. You've suddenly shown me the cover of the box. It all makes sense. This was a road to Damascus experience. It was just a revelation for him. Tears were welling in his eyes and about to cascade down his cheeks. I could see them, Michelle could see them, and his wife could see them. And his wife leant to the tissue box, pulled out a tissue and handed it to him. And he went, how did you know I was going to cry? We could tell by the context, we could see the tears, but he was the last to be aware of his emotional state, which all means all behavior modification mechanisms won't work. If you're not cognitively aware, how can you use cognitive behavior therapy? 
major problems. And this is why I want psychotherapy designed by ASPIS, for ASPIS, administered by ASPIS. Okay. Because otherwise it's neurotypical, look at me and tell me all your feelings. And the person goes, no, no you're just being non-compliant. You're not taking this therapy seriously. So I think there needs to be. And I have found through the years, because one of the characteristics of autism in girls can be to observe, analyze, and imitate, to look for patterns, that they became a psychologist at three years old. And they discovered patterns and interactions that aren't in the psychology textbooks because they're written by neurotypicals. And that's why I think those with autism can be very successful, not only in technology and in the arts, but the caring professions. Absolutely. And the most caring people I know. When I see teenagers saying, I think with autism, I, th I think I I'd like to be a psychologist. But I and I go, great, good on you. Go for it, because we need more of you, because you know you have credibility, you need to explore it, but design a therapy for those who share the same characteristics. We also know that there can be, uh, how shall I put it, tides of autism. For a parent, when your daughter wakes up, comes into the kitchen, you look in her eyes and go, oh dear, autistic day. <laughs> You say, right, she's emotionally fragile, socially withdrawn, intellectual fog, oh dear. Walks into class, the teacher looks at her and goes, uh, library at lunchtime. No surprise tests, etc. And the tide of autism has come in. Now that level of autism may be totally different to when that child went to sleep. And they wake up with a tide of autism. Something happens or doesn't happen in sleep that can affect the expression and severity of autism. So what we need to do is check the tides of autism by a mood diary or an autism level diary. So it may be that uh, mum's looking at that uh, chart and talks to the um, primary school teacher on a Friday afternoon and says to her, according to the charts, next uh, week she's going to be fine Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Thursday, she's going to be a bit iffy, and Friday, next week, she's going to be suspended. <laughs> so she's not going to go to school on Friday. Can you give me her work for Friday on Thursday so she can do it at home? Otherwise, she'll have a notoriety. She can't cope with the academic and the social curriculum. What people need to realise... Those with autism work at school and in the work environment twice as hard as anybody else because they're doing the social and the cognitive. Now, we have a number of excellent publications. I'm going to do a promotion for this because Danuta, friend and colleague, who's based in Melbourne, has written an excellent book. She has a clinic in Melbourne called Unique You, which is for those with autism, girls and women. And she has a, a remarkable expertise. Also, Rudy Simone and Asper Girls, one of the first books that came out, beautifully written. There are other books by Karen McKibben, a clinical psychologist in the, based in the United States. But she's done a huge survey of hundreds of women with autism throughout the world and come out with some particular patterns and ideas. For professionals, I strongly recommend this book. Also... Oh dear. As a clinician, my concern isn't autism. Not at all. No. It's different. Different way of perceiving, thinking, learning and relating. You found something more interesting in life than socialising. That's who you are. That's great. My concern is neurotypicals who can't tolerate anyone who's different and they have fun targeting anyone who's different. And for teenage girls and women, these are male predators of not reading the signals, not understanding appropriate places, and so on. Leanne holiday Willie, who wrote Pretending to be Normal, has written a subsequent book called Safety Skills for Asperger Women. It's ideas and strategies to spot male predators. Because unfortunately, many of the women that I see have been in very unfortunate situations. One of them that uh, Leanne had was she was in Texas, very hot day, very hot. She wanted some air conditioning, so she went into a bar to cool down. 
And she was sitting at a table on her own and there was a guy at the bar itself came up to her and said, are you hot? To which she said, yeah, I'm really hot. But she had no idea that there are two meanings for hot. As far as she was concerned, it was her body temperature, not her interest in sex. So you can get all sorts of confusion. Another book is by Debbie Brown, The Aspie Girl's Guide to Being Safe with Men. The unwritten rules nobody is telling you. So we have to teach them the dark side of neurotypicals. They're not all as nice as you. And those with autism tend to take people by what they say, not their character, not by that built-in radar to spot they're not nice. Michelle and I have written uh, a book on depression for teens and adults. It's a self-help book, but that can be used not just with a psychologist, but at home with someone who may be able to support you because we lose them. There are some for whom they say, I can't cope with this any longer. They have a depression attack and I'm out of here. We'll have one woman that I know who's uh, married to a wonderful husband and her special interest is horses. <laughs> and actually she said, her husband was sitting next to her. She said, yeah, I think I love horses more than my husband. <laughs> it's true. Uh, and she gets depressed, and she got so depressed one day, she said, I'm going to hang myself. That's it. I can't cope with it any longer. I'm going to hang myself. So she went around the farm looking for a clean rope, but it had to be clean. She was not going to hang herself on a dirty rope, but she couldn't find a clean rope. And by the time she had exhausted all ropes, ah, oh, it's gone. It's a bit like Yen, you were saying, that it will go. And one of the things we're trying to say is, it will go. Okay. Don't know when, don't know how, but it will go. The sooner the better, and when it's over, we'll do something fun together. Because one of the characteristics of autism is a depression attack. It's an absolute deluge of negative emotion. Now, uh, on YouTube, there is an excellent series of videos by Maya Tode. She calls herself the Anne Mish. Maya is from Copenhagen in Denmark, and she has Asperger's. And the thing is, from the age of seven, she would have episodic depression, suicide attacks. What's the point of life? I'm going to hold my breath till I die. <clears throat> but anyway, the seeds were there from early on. Now, she developed a remarkable concept that I am now using and encouraging called energy accounting. This was designed for adults, but can also be used for teenagers. And the idea in energy accounting is that you have in your day the concept of that energy bank account that sometimes events will occur or people that you meet will drain you of energy. And in that draining of energy, you are going to become energy depleted. So there are energy withdrawals and energy deposits. There are things that will energize you. It can be Mr. Kitty, your cat, Mr. Kitty. Mr. Kitty is probably one of your fastest energizers and just being in his mere presence is enough. Just knowing he exists is enough. <laughs> knowing he exists is enough. Okay, so what we do is go through what may be potential energy withdrawals and deposits. This is the cheat sheet. These are the things that we found that withdraw energy, deplete you. Socialising. Yes, the person with autism can socialise, can be the life and soul of the party. Absolutely fantastic. But tomorrow, social migraine, under the covers, in the cupboard, that's it. I'm going to pay for this. It was so good. Coping with change, even if it's to a preferred activity. Too many changes. I have to use a lot of mental energy to recalibrate my mind to the same situation. And if my main way of socializing is to have a huge and rich memory store of social events that I can use to imitate and become the person in that situation. If I've never seen that situation before, if it's totally new, I have no idea what my role and script will be. Making a mistake. Sensory sensitivity, daily living skills can drain you with energy. One of the major ways of energy draining is coping with anxiety. And for the kids, they use so much energy coping with anxiety at school, there's no energy left for the schoolwork. There can be overanalyzing social performance, analysis to paralysis, especially inhibiting sleep. 
Sensitivity to other people's moods, being teased or excluded. Crowds, yeah, you don't have to interact with people, it's just lots of people around. Government agencies, Centrelink, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, body shape, uh, it can be perceived injustice. And as a psychologist, I say there is astronomical psychology. And some people are emotional black holes. <laughs> they suck away all your energy. You are just with them, <laughs> and it's gone. And it never comes back. <laughs> They suck away your energy. Keep away from them. Okay, what are the deposits? Solitude, but it takes time. Special interest is your fastest energy restorative. Physical activity, animals and nature, computer games, meditation, caring for others. Yes. It can be nutrition. Get rid of junk food. Sleep. Uh, reading Harry Potter books, but I thought I want to put that in because it's one I like. Anyway, right. Um, mental health vacation day, that, okay, I'm going to take a day off because I haven't got the energy to cope. Information on the internet, being with pets, and certain people are the sun. They have that ability to totally energise you. So in energy accounting, we have a currency, a numerical value, how much an activity is draining or refreshing from day to day with an energy range from 1 to 100. So on some days, you may get socialising. Ah, oh, socialising was like 8. Today was a 20. Ah, oh, today, nine, no, 100. Today was 100. So what you're trying to do is balance the books between energy depletion and energy restoration. So we add a numerical value of debits or credits, and if needed, must schedule more energy-infusing activities into the next day or week. So we fight autism with autism. We're pedantic, and we have lists. So this is the list of withdrawals and deposits. So you may have on the left column, what is it that drains you of energy? OK, add it up, 20, 40, 60, 80, 20, total, 360. What were today's deposits? 20, 20, 30, 40, total, 240. Oh, Dear. You can cope with that for a while, but as you are sinking, you'll reach a tipping point and you'll just go straight down into a depression. This is an illustration. It's a teenage girl, uh, Ellen. She's, I think, 15 at this stage. These are the things that debit her account. Being late to school, 10 to 14. When I ask the guys why, because everyone's looking at you. That's what drains me of energy. Crowds, 20 to 60. Now, mum being cranky, when I think mum's upset with me, when she's snappy, 30 to 100. Now, when we analysed it further, mum can be cranky with her Aspie brother, but it's nothing to do with her. But the mere fact that mum's cranky infects her a huge degree. Um, teachers being snappy, uh, premenstrual tension, 10 to 30. Friends not being nice to each other, 20 to 30. This was important. Friends' own problems, 20 to 90. Wow. Okay, then um, a few other things there. Team sport, 30 to 40. Okay, what tops her up? TV programs, Star Kids, um, Harry Potter, Doctor Who, Sherlock, and Tolkien. I like those because they can be great restoratives. Reading alone, 30 to 40. Dancing freestyle, gets home from school, goes into a bedroom, locks the door so her brother can't get in, cranks up the hi-fi, dances freestyle, 30 to 50. But down there is talking to boys, 10 to 30. Girls drain me, boys infuse me. Very important. Other components we're aware of, can be substance abuse for teenagers and adults because if you don't manage your emotions in an effective way, you may discover there are alternative ways with alcohol and marijuana. Now, sometimes that substance abuse is, yes, for emotion management. It's to engage reality, to make you relaxed in a social setting, but then you don't do things by half, or to escape reality of a bubble of numbness and I don't care. So alcohol and marijuana is freely available in modern society. It's a social lubricant. It reduces social anxiety. But you also then become in a member of a group with clear rules, dress, language, codes of conduct, and it's a relaxant. 
So please, emotion, regulation and management is important because if you don't, they may discover ways of achieving it that we do not recommend. Also, there can be a high level of anorexia nervosa and ASD. Research suggests that actually about one in four of those in eating disorder clinics have signs of an autism spectrum disorder. It's not always a disorder of body image. It can be issues of fascination with and association with diet, exercise, food rituals to prevent feelings of being out of control or to eliminate disabling anxiety or a special interest in nutrition and calories, which means that any psychotherapy that is for gender dysphoria, that anything that may be helping in terms of eating disorders, borderline, must be adjusted for the autistic mindset. Otherwise, it's going to cause huge amount of problems. Now, 